Okay, well, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians. We're going to uh, read uh, quite a large portion from chapter 12. And uh, we're going to start this morning, although we've been preaching on the, the Holy Spirit for about five weeks now, we're going to start getting into this section on the gifts of the Spirit. And going to be spending probably about, I don't know, at least three weeks here together on the gifts of the Spirit. There's a lot to cover. And really, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is where we have to begin to, to start this conversation. This might be perhaps one of the most uh, misunderstood, perhaps misused things in all in Christendom is the gifts of the Spirit and what they truly are and what they're truly for and what, of course, they're not and how to recognize counterfeits from the true gifts of the Spirit as taught to us in the Scriptures. And so that's what we're going to start today. We're going to start by looking at 1 Corinthians 12. And we've got to lay some groundwork here so that the next weeks make a little bit more sense. We'll do that. So I'm going to approach this sermon less of a preaching uh, aspect and more from a teaching aspect because we really have to lay this groundwork. And if we don't lay this groundwork, then we will be confused going forward. And of course, the spirit of God is not a spirit of confusion. It's a spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and truth. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. So let's go ahead and read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 11 with one another. Verses 1 through 11. If you don't have your uh, Bibles with you, it'll be up on the screen here. But let's follow along in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says this, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, this of course is Paul writing to the church in Corinth, I do not want you to be unaware. And this is a very important phrase. I do not want you to be ignorant. I want you to understand the gifts of the Spirit. And then he's going to go in and tell us about them. Verse 2, you know that when you were pagans, that's important, that is, it gives us a very uh, big clue as to why the Corinthians were in the mess they were. For when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. Your translation might say dumb idols or foolish idols. However you were led. Basically, you went anywhere and everywhere. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. And to another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles. And to another, prophecy, which we're going to get to next week. That doesn't mean looking into the future. That means an understanding of the Scriptures. And to another, the distinguishing of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of those tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. So beginning in 1 Corinthians 12, this is one of perhaps the most interesting, I think it's the most interesting and most eye-opening sections of Scripture on the Holy Spirit. Of course, there's uh, more sections on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit in Romans and in Peter, uh, 1 Peter. Um, but 1 Corinthians 12 really gives us some insight into what the gifts of the Spirit are. And I want to make it th this point very clear. It's not just beginning in chapter 12. Actually, the entire book of 1 Corinthians from the first chapter of right on through the end, is about the gifts of the Spirit. It is about the misuse of the gifts of the Spirit. And it is about the corruption and the carnality that was in the Corinthian church. And that led to the abuse and the counterfeiting of the gifts of the Spirit. So we have to look at 1 Corinthians as a whole. And I'm going to do my best to do that this morning as we lay the groundwork moving forward. We will be looking uh, kind of through 1 Corinthians to understand how the Corinthian church got to the point that they were so messed up. And they were so messed up. And we'll look at that in a while. And because of their wrong thoughts and wrong understanding and wrong ideas of the Holy Spirit and his working and his gifts given to them, they abused them, and most importantly, they allowed Satan to counterfeit them in their church. And that still happens today in many, many churches across the world. 
And so we're going to approach this subject, like I said, from a, a teaching aspect as opposed to preaching to you this morning, uh, although there will be some of that. Uh, there will be some contemplation. There will be some self-thought uh, uh, th uh, and, and looking into our, ourself by the, by the Holy Spirit to help us understand where we stand. But I'm mostly concerned this morning by setting, with setting the record straight. Setting the record straight concerning spiritual gifts and what they're given to us for. Why do we have them and why are they so important? There are many questions we're going to answer together over the next several weeks. And we're going to look at the various gifts in detail in the coming weeks. So I want you to be prepared for that. I want you to understand that's where we're going. Um, don't be, um, don't think we're not going to get there. We're going to get there. It's just going to take some time because I want to be very sober-minded about this teaching. And I want to be very thorough about this teaching because unfortunately, I don't think teaching on the gifts of the Spirit has been thorough enough throughout the church. And so we're going to be very thorough together. And so with this entire topic, I want uh, to encourage you to set aside what you think you may know, and I want us to open up the Word of God together. And let's look at what the Bible teaches us, not what we think we've experienced, not what we think we know about the gifts of the Spirit, but let's look specifically at what the Bible teaches us. Because brothers and sisters, remember when I established, when we, when we started this teaching on the Holy Spirit, I established this is our only authority. Anything not found in this is not authority. This is our only authority on all matters of faith and all matters of living our faith, including the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look to God's Word. In church, God's Word very clearly teaches us what the gifts are, what they're for, and how they're to be used. It's not a mystery. It's not a mystery. What happens is, what happens is men through the ages, most importantly, probably most prolifically in the last 100 years, have distorted God's word. But it's all here and it's very clear. And so we're going to look at the clarity of God's word and pray that he gives us wisdom. Because there's probably nothing that's been more abused within the church than the gifts of the Spirit. More misused, more misunderstood. And so we're going to take some time to clarify that. Now, in order to do this, we kind of have to start at the beginning. And we have to start at what the church is. What is the church? Because if we don't understand what the church is, we'll never understand why the gifts were given to the church and what they're to be used for. And so we're going to kind of go back. This might seem uh, elementary teaching to some of you. However, I don't think it is. And you'll see what, why it's important that we go back to define the church before we look at the gifts very, in a very specific manner. Very plainly, godly ministry in the church and in the world cannot exist outside of the gifts of the Spirit cannot exist outside of the gifts of the Spirit. The ministry that we've been given to do in the church can't be done without the gifts of the Spirit. So you might ask, how important are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? They're vital. They're vital to the ministry that we've been given to do. And brothers and sisters, of course, we need to understand what the church is. The church isn't a building. I think we know that. It's not a building. It's not these four walls or however many walls we have in here. It's not a place where we get, go to get married. It's not a place at all. The, the church is a living organism. It is a living body. Many parts that make up one living body. And not just living now, but an eternal living body. When you think of the church, don't think of this building or that building down the street. Think of the eternal, living, moving, breathing, dynamic, eternal body of Jesus Christ, right? Christ is the head, and we make up the many parts of the church. So the church is a living organism. It is us, and it is the Holy Spirit in us that creates the church. It is nothing else. It is not a nice building. We are the church. In church, in order for us to be a vibrant church, the Holy Spirit has to be at present within us and at work within us. Without the work of the true gifts of the Spirit, the church is crippled at best, crippled at best. And we'll look at how crippled the Corinthian church was here in just a moment. You see, the church is the full representation of Jesus Christ on earth. I'm going to say that again because it's important. Brothers and sisters, you and I are the fullness of the representation of Jesus Christ on earth. That's our goal and our duty as a church. Now, it's expressed in many ways, of course, through the gospel, Right? We have to go forth with the gospel. We have to use our spiritual gifts in the way God has given them to us and how he has given them to us. So 
The church literally exists to complete the full ministry of Jesus Christ. You can read about that in Ephesians 1.23 if you'd like to uh, later. I did put not all but most of my source texts on the back of the bulletin this morning so you can go back and read these texts if you'd like. You see, the church is not a human institution or an earthly organization at all. It's neither one of those things. It is an eternal, living, breathing organism. It is the people of God. It's many members. It's believers all together. And so in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said that the gates of hell could not destroy this church. The gates of hell could not destroy this living church. Why not? Because Jesus Christ can't be destroyed and he is the head and the one who breathes life into the church. And so not only is the church living and eternal, but it's indestructible. And church, that is the definition of who the people of God are. And that's a very profound definition. If we start thinking of our job, our calling as Christians together in that way, if we start thinking about the church in that way, that we are just an extension of Jesus Christ, and not only an extension, but we represent the fullness of Christ on earth. And now if you're thinking ahead, which some of you like to think ahead, that's going to make a lot of sense when we start talking about the spiritual gifts and what they're for, Right? If we're the church and we're supposed to represent the fullness of Christ on earth, then those spiritual gifts must have something to do with representing that fullness, right? And so that's where we're going. Because we are eternal beings and are a part of eternal living organism, the Holy Spirit has given us supernatural gifts to be that representation on earth. And why is that? So that we can effectively minister for the specific purpose of this, of building the church, of edifying the church, and of witnessing, being witnessing, witnesses testifying to Jesus Christ. So we've been given the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, for those purposes, okay? So when you think of the gifts of the Spirit, we're given them for the duty and the privilege, really, of edifying each other, edifying the church, building the church through those ministries, and testifying to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that as a Christian, you are a part of this living, breathing, eternal body of Christ? Do you understand that it is your duty to this body to use your spiritual gifts in order to build this body up? Not just this body, but the body of Christ everywhere. You see, many people don't use their spiritual gifts in that way. Many people use their spiritual gifts to bring honor to themselves. And that's what happened in the Corinthian church. Spiritual gifts are not for you specifically. They're not for you specifically. They're for the church. They are for edifying, building up, and testifying to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if this is the goal of how we use our spiritual gifts for those purposes, then how tragic would it be if some of us here this morning don't even know what our spiritual gifts are? If that's the goal, if that's what we've been given spiritual gifts for, to represent Christ, and we're going to talk about this more. It's going to blow your mind probably if you've never thought about spiritual gifts this way. If we have been given spiritual gifts in order to testify to the gospel, to edify each other, and to build up God's living church on earth, how tragic is it if some of you don't even know what your spiritual gift is, let alone how to use it for those purposes? But more than this, more than this, we need to know the biblical truth of the teaching of the spiritual gifts. Because not only is there danger and a lack of knowledge, right? Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed by what? Their lack of knowledge. Not only is there danger in having lack of knowledge, but there is danger if we don't understand spiritual gifts and what they're to be used for because Satan counterfeits them. Because Satan wants nothing more than to throw chaos into this living, breathing body of Christ. He wants nothing more than to muddy the waters or worse yet, completely lead churches to an apostate state. You see, he counterfeits them because this. This is important. Satan counterfeits spiritual gifts because they are absolutely necessary to the expansion of the church. They are necessary. Without them, the work of the church cannot, would not, will not be done. You see, nobody counterfeits an invaluable thing, right? Nobody counterfeits an invaluable thing. 
And so Satan counterfeits these gifts to confuse and to distort the real purpose for them and what they are in the first place. His goal is to disrupt the function of the church, to disrupt our mission in any way he can. And unfortunately, he has used uh, a lack of knowledge, a lack of discernment of the spiritual gifts to do this. The church is a body and every one of us here that is in Christ is a vital member of that body. And as members of the same body, it is our goal then to function in harmony and in symphony with each other. Right? Did you read, when we read, did you, excuse me, you did read, when we read Corinthians 1, 12, what was said over and over again? The same spirit, the one spirit does this. The same spirit does this in you, does this in you, does this in you, does this in you. What the Bible is teaching us is there is unity in the spirit. Unity in the spirit. There is unity when we are using our spiritual gifts. And we're going to get into that a little bit more in a moment. And so we need to understand that Satan doesn't want unity in the church. He doesn't want unity in the body. And so he'll try to disrupt that by getting us to believe things about spiritual gifts that aren't true. And when we're not using the spiritual gifts as led by the Spirit, it brings utter chaos to the church. And listen, I know many of you have questions surrounding spiritual gifts this morning. What are all the spiritual gifts? How many are there? Are there, are there how important are there? How many do I have? Um, we're going to get to these questions, okay? And I don't want you to be disappointed that we're not getting to most of these questions today. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. And they're very important questions, and I want to answer those for you using the Word of God. But before we can do that, we have to understand the purpose of these gifts, the purpose of them, before we can even begin to understand what ours might be. So bear with me as I'm going to teach on this topic thoroughly, as I said before, and I'm not going to rush through it. So let's turn our attention back to our text this morning. It's from the book of 1 Corinthians, and the biblical understanding of spiritual gifts really is found in this book, throughout the whole book. Not just in chapters 12 through 14, which we like to turn to because it gives us an idea of using our spiritual gifts in orderly worship, but it's the entire book from the first chapter through to the end. This book is about the use of spiritual gifts employed in the body of Christ. An understanding of the situation in the Corinthian church then is basic to our understanding of the spiritual gifts. We have to have the understanding of what the church is. Then we have to have an understanding of what the, what the situation in the Corinthian church was. How did they get to this point? And how were they abusing the spiritual gifts? Well, the Corinthian church was established by the Apostle Paul during his second missionary journey. You can read about that in Acts 18 if you'd like to later. He spent 18 months approximately in this church establishing it, teaching, growing, and guiding this church. However, not long after Paul left, several moral and spiritual failures and problems developed in this church and actually quite rapidly quite rapidly. They were so severe, in fact, that Paul was astonished to hear the reports that came back from at least three separate people to him about the condition of the church. Not just people outside the church, but people in the church. Said, Paul, there are some problems, major problems in this church. What do we do? What do we do? And Paul was astonished to hear what this church we had just left had so quickly fallen into. And so the entire book of 1 Corinthians is dedicated to addressing these issues. If you've ever read through Corinthians before and thought, whoa, these people had some problems. You're right, they did. Let's look at some of the problems in the church. And they'll be up here on the screen. I've got, I, I do have, um, I can send you the slide maybe if you'd like it because it's a lot to write down, but these are where all these problems are uh, located throughout the book of 1 Corinthians as Paul addresses the issues in the church. But let's look at them. Divisions. Divisions in the church. Well, the spirit brings unity. So there's a problem right there. You're not operating in the spirit if there's divisions. Human wisdom was being brought into the church. Of course, we all know how many problems human wisdom brings to the equation. Human personality quicks, clicks. Now, this was, uh, they came from religion, pagan religions that were basically built upon cults of personality. That's why Paul addresses and says, what do you say? I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas. I follow Paul. 
And some others, you say, I follow Christ. Because the pagan worship of the Corinthians that they drug into the church was all about following a certain person. They followed Aristotle. They followed Plato. They followed this philosopher, that philosopher. And they brought that same understanding into the church. And so they started forming these human personality cliques. Well, I follow Paul. Well, I follow Apollos. Well, I follow Cephas. And so on and so forth. So that began to come into the church. Carnality, just in general, all forms of, de of moral depravity started finding its way into the church. Sexual perversion, listen, including in was celebrated in the church. Okay? You can read about that, of course, uh, in, uh, if you'd like to, in chapter 5. That's where it specifically addresses that. Just worldliness in every way possible. That's in chapter 5 as well. Lawsuits. You see, the Corinthian church, we have to understand, they were saved out of pagan practices and they were saved out of a culture that loved to argue they loved to argue. Going to court to the Corinthians was fun. They loved to do it. And so they brought that into the church. They loved to argue in open discourse. Also, um, and, and this wasn't in my notes, but I read, it, th I read that this this week, to Corinthianize, it was it turned into a verb, meant to prostitute. They were known for their orgies and prostitution as well. So if you, if, if you wanted to, a derogatory term would be like, oh man, that guy is a Corinthianizer or he likes to Corinthianize. That's how depraved this town was. And these are the people being saved out of that. They're bringing it right into the church though, however. Rebellion against authority, chapter four. Marital conflict, chapter seven. Abuse of Christian liberties, that's a big one. We, and I think Brother Joel and I talked about, it was you, right? Talked about the abuse of Christian liberties just this week. Flaunting our liberty in front of a weaker brother or sister, that, that, is, that is greatly offended by that liberty. And one of those things is, of course, eating meat offered to idols. Paul says it's fine to do that because you're not worshiping that idol, but you know what? You might offend somebody and so don't do that in front of them. Idolatry. They were bringing their, their, their pagan gods into the church. Okay, this is a pretty messed up church. You can see that. Pride, chapter 8 and 10. Selfishness, 11. Demon worship. Demon worship, right in the church. Insubordination of women, which is uh, a form of feminism. They were unwilling to cover their heads. They were unwilling to stop speaking out of turn in church. They were, uh, they were, uh, they were an, an, an adulter adulterous, rebellious women in this church. Abuses of God's roles for men and women in the, in, the, in the home and in marriage. Abuses of communion in feasts. And then look it. Paul wraps all these things up with the next four or next two, uh, three chapters talking about how this led to the abuses of their spiritual gifts. It's important to understand where Paul's going here. He said, look at all these things you're doing wrong and look at the most egregious of all of them as you're abusing and blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And he ends with that. So this is some, there's some serious problems going on in this church. We need to understand that. The church is supposed to be this living, breathing, unified representation of Christ on earth. And it was anything but. Anything but. And the outcome then was the spiritual gifts were anything but as well. You see, church life was nothing more than a carnal sin fest. And the use of spiritual gifts were abused along with every other aspect of their lives and their religion. In, in 1 Corinthians 1 7 says that they lacked no spiritual gift. This is important. Paul opens the letter by saying, Listen, you guys, you, I was just there. You guys don't lack any of the spiritual gifts. I saw your congregation. I saw that you had all these gifts. You lack none of them, and yet you're ignorant on how they ought to be used. Church, I believe that about us. God has brought this assembly, even those that aren't here this morning, that, that, uh, that this is their church home. He has brought us here so that we will lack no gift. We will lack no gift. Yet are we ignorant on how to use those gifts for the purpose they were given? That's what we're going to begin to unpack this morning. You see, the Corinthian church was saved out of very pagan and very strange religious practices. We don't understand how strange they were until you go back and study the pagan religions of the area around Corinth. They were saved out of these pagan, strange religious practices. Let's look at their pagan practices just briefly so we can understand why this stuff so readily and easily found its way into the church as soon as they abandoned the leading of the Spirit. You see, in their pagan religious, religions, 
it was normal, and actually you were looked at as more spiritual if you fell into weird, strange trances. If you babbled strange things, you were looked at as more um, spiritual than the next person. If you participated in orgies, you were more spiritual than someone else. If worship was a frenzy, disorderly pace, that was a spiritual worship in their pagan religions. And they were very closely related to demonic practices in these pagan religions. So you have all these things going on. They think, okay, to be more spiritual is I have to be louder, more bizarre, stranger, and fall into more trances using incense and such to do so. That's what they were saved out of in these pagan religions, and yet they brought these things into the church. The supernatural mysteries of religion dominated their idea of what religion was. And brothers and sisters, the religion of Christ, the truth, is not based on mysteries. It's based on solid truth. And they weren't used to that. They weren't used to that. The word of God is our truth. And everything we need to know is here. And yet they were, they looked at religion as the more mysterious it was, the more spiritual it was. So we need to understand that as well. You see, to them, the work of the Spirit then, with this mindset, the work of the Spirit was erratic. The work of the Holy Spirit was trance-like. It was loud worship. It was disorder. It was screaming over the other person. It was singing over this person while this person's falling in a trance and maybe laughing uncontrollably while this person's doing all these things together, all happening at once. That was their idea of wor Christian worship. However, it's pagan. If you notice, and if you've ever read through 1 Corinthians before, chapters 12 through 14 is dedicated to Paul restoring order to worship. He says God is a God of order, and everything must be done in turn. That was not what they were used to, nor what they were practicing. And so the gifts of the Spirit and their dim understanding was to bring them prominence, to look more spiritual than the person next to them, to outdo, to out-prophesy, the more bizarre their behavior was, was more, the more spiritual they were. And they could place themselves on a higher echelon of spirituality than the person next to them. That was the idea in Corinth. That was their idea of worship. For example, somebody who stood up in the congregation and gave some utterance, whether it was a language, a prophecy, or an interpretation, was considered to be godlier than someone who, let's say, just had the gift of helps. Oh, you just have the gift of helps? I utter strange utterances. I interpret. I do this. You see, their spiritual gifts, or what they thought were spiritual gifts, they weren't. They were counterfeited by Satan, became a point of pride for them. It had nothing to do with building up and edifying the body of Christ. It had nothing to do with unity. It had everything to do with, look at me, look at me, look at me. And so, to this church, to this congregation, the gift of languages became the most important. And Paul addresses that. Paul addresses that. The gift of languages became most important and was exploited. In church, this is no different than today. There are many churches who teach if you don't speak in a tongue, you are not fully spirit-filled. I've been a part of some of those churches. They actually teach that garbage. And if you've ever been told that before, it's a lie, and you can find that lie right in the Bible. Paul says that is ab absolutely nothing to do with anything. Some of you are given the gift of tongues, but it is not better than any other gift. And if you've ever been told that you are not truly spirit-filled unless you speak a tongue, they're lying to you. Run from that lie as fast as you can. It's been dealt with thousands of years ago in the, God, in the Word of God, and yet Satan has brought it up again. Okay, it is a lie. You are not less spiritual if you do not have a gift of a language. Okay? I've been a part of those churches that is not truth, and it's the same lie Satan got the Corinthians to believe, and it's amazing to me that there are denominations out there that teach the same lie. That's right in the Word of God exposed for us all to see. It's tragic. So let's move on from that. The sensational erratic speaking that occurred as if it were a true gift of languages was given precedence over someone who had a different gift. And so what happened was to look more spiritual than the next guy, people counterfeited the gifts pretended like they had a gift of tongue, pretended like they had a gift of interpretation, pretended like they had the gift of prophecy, which really is understanding scripture and speaking it. It's not looking into the future. And we'll define that in coming weeks. 
You see, they thought the more bizarre they could act, the more spiritual they would be, and they would get the seats of honor. They would get to come early and eat the love feast. It was all about them. All about them. Again, this is no different than many charismatic churches today. Maybe in a less dramatic form, but it is alive and well. So we briefly discussed this when I told you that the work of the Spirit is not certain things, right? This work of the Spirit is absolutely, unequivocally not barking like dogs, not falling on the floor and rolling around, not laughing uncontrollably loudly over somebody else while they're trying to do something. That is not the work of the Spirit, okay? It's, uh, it's not falling into a strange trance. Those are pagan counterfeits to the Spirit to the Holy Spirit and to the spiritual gifts. We need to understand that because that, uh, th those type of practices that happen in churches, it's gone on too long without anyone speaking out against it. Too long. It's tragic. You see, they lived during the idolatrous days when this ecstatic, erratic worship, these utterances made by pagan priests and pagan worshipers was the norm. You need to understand that, and they brought that into the church. Many of you have taken the church history class, and in, in, in the first session, what did the Catholic Church bring into Christianity when Catholicism began around, the, around in, in, mid, early to mid-fourth century, right? They brought pagan worship into the church, and it defined it as Catholicism. Same thing happened here. This, is, this had more to do with Gnosticism. For many of you who have uh, taken the church history class, we've talked about Gnosticism. This was a Gnostic belief. You can't really know God. He's a mystery, and so we need to treat religion as mysterious. The Corinthians had Gnostic backgrounds. God comes along, saves them through the power of the Holy Spirit, and teaches them truth, and they weren't used to truth. They were used to mysterious religions. And so they lived during this time when demonic spirits and demonic control and worship was thought to be the highest level of spiritual worship. That's the kind of culture the church lived in in Corinth. So we need to understand that, what the church is and what this culture looked like and why this was so easy for them to fall into these things and why they did it. You see, when these pagan practices did infiltrate the church, it was easy for them to think, yeah, this is religion. This is the way it works. We only had 18 months with Paul and he's gone, and this is what we know from our old religions, so this must be right. This must be right. You see, in their carnal state, they confused the work of the Holy Spirit, and it brought a lot of problems, a lot of problems to their assembly. You see, the gifts are given to you and to me, not to set me apart from you, and not to set you apart from me, not to prove that you are more spiritual or I am more spiritual or this person is less spiritual. They are given for the express purpose of unity, of edifying, and of representing Christ, okay? So if you have a spiritual gift and it is not being used for those things, for unity, one spirit, and if it's not used to edify and it is not used to build up the body of Christ, you are using your spiritual gift either improperly or you are a counterfeit, we need to understand that. You see, each gift is important to the function of the church. Neither of them is more important. But because of jealousy over the misuse of spiritual gifts, the Corinthian church was fractured. I want that gift. And so I don't have it. I'm going to counterfeit it. Happens in the church, unfortunately, today as well. You see, everything that was a part of their carnal lives was manifested in the church. The world's religion infiltrated the church and they began to do things with pagan definitions and they called it Christianity. And instead of these gifts being, what, being used for what they were supposed to be, they brought chaos to the church. Disorder, ungodly, disorderly, ungodly, pagan worship. So think about this. Let's say you visited the Corinthian church, right? You, you went into the church and you got there a little bit later than uh, maybe some of the other people did. But by the time you got there, the love feast was already eaten by the rich people. They got to get there before you. And they ate all the food and they drank all the wine, so much so that they not only were they gluttonous, but they were drunk when you arrived at church. 
And I'm not making up stories. This was the Corinthian church I'm telling you about. Let's say you visited the Corinthian church. Everyone's, we got there, and the rich people who got the seat of honor, they were already there. They ate all the love feasts. The poor people, and you as a visitor, you didn't get to get there on time uh, to eat this feast. And everyone was gluttonous and drunk by the time you got there. Okay, so that's number one. Then that creates disunity because the poor people, they're mad. They wanted, they wanted some of that love feast. They wanted to celebrate fellowship together. And so disunity already begins at the beginning of the service and it becomes grumbling. And then that grumbling turns into arguing with each other before the service has even started. Not only that, but the poor people have to sit on the floor, which brings more disunity to the church, more grumbling. And there's great division. The drunks are loud and obnoxious and you start saying to yourself, I think there's something wrong with this church because you have this spirit of discernment, right? They abuse communion. They drink all the wine to the point where the people that weren't drunk before are now drunk. They eat all the bread and then regular service begins. And what happens when regular service begins? People start shouting over one another uttering strange utterances while one person's over, person is over here interpreting, while one person's lying on the floor in a trance, while one person sings a song try to, trying to be heard above everyone else and sings at the top of their lungs. And all this is going on at the start of service. And you'd leave that church thinking, these people are out of their minds. And they were. And you'd be right. Now, church, I know this doesn't happen maybe at the, to the extent of this, but there are churches that operate similar to this, where you'd leave and say, wow, these people are out of their minds, and they probably are. What is, this is what was going on in Corinthian, the Corinthian church, and this is why Paul says this in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen, right before he gets into this whole discourse on how to use the spiritual gifts properly. In eleven seventeen of 1 Corinthians, he says this, you come together, but not for the better for the worse. That's 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17. Paul says, look at all the stuff you do. You come together, but man, you don't do it for the better. And that's the only reason that we are to come together is to do it for the better, to glorify God, to edify each other, to build up his church and to testify for the gospel. That's the reason. And you're coming not for the better, but actually not even neutral. You're coming for the worse of things. And then he tells them how, in starting in chapter 12, how they're abusing worship. Paul has to straighten out their mess. And now with this, as an, like I said, as an extreme example, but there are churches today that function similarly with erratic, ecstatic worship. Worship. Chaos. Things going on here and here and here and here and here. And brothers and sisters, that is not godly orderly worship as listed in the word of God and is not the work of the Spirit. God is a God of order from literally day one. Read the creation account, church. If you want to talk about a God of order, read the creation account. You want to talk about a God of order? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, man, woman, child. God is a God of order. He orders everything. And worship to him is no different. I'm not talking about dry worship, liturgy, where you take the whole work of the Spirit out completely. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being led of the Spirit in an orderly, God-honoring, edifying, building of, up of each other in God's church fashion. That's the kind of worship we need. That's the kind of worship we need. Speaking out of turn, falling over, one person giving a prophecy while one person is singing, it's not what God has intended. So in Corinth, this church was filled with really... Pagan priests, seers, prophets, people in ecstasy, ecstasy, trances, claiming, claiming to have the work of the Spirit in their life and the gifts of the Spirit. You see, I think something, uh, of, of course, happened with, with, the, with the Corinthian church. You see, Paul told them who the Holy Spirit was and to expect a move of the Holy Spirit. And they, 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 had, the old, they had the Old Testament scriptures, Joel 2.28. Many of you know this says, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters will, shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young, young men shall, shall see visions. They knew this stuff was coming. They knew Jesus told his disciples that when I leave, hey, l listen, I'm gonna send a comforter to you. Jesus promised the Spirit, Acts 1, 5, Acts, Acts 1, 5. They knew the Spirit uh, had descended already. Uh, Acts 1, 8, they knew that the Spirit was going to give them power. They just had a dim understanding of what that looked like. And so they're easily, easily swayed by Satan 
and counterfeited and confused by Satan. And so the problem was twofold. First, they didn't know how to differentiate spiritual gifts from demonic counterfeits. They had no idea how to do it. That's number one. The second problem was that everyone wanted the same gift because they thought it was more, they thought it was uh, more spiritual. And it was confusion. So, in chapter, so for 11 chapters, 1 through 11, Paul convinces them of their carnality. They, Paul says, listen, you have no idea what spiritual gifts even are. You can't possibly know. Look at the sin you're living in. You, you can't even understand spiritual gifts. So let me set the record straight. Paul spends 11 chapters convincing them that they, can't, they, can't, they don't have the ability, the knowledge, the wisdom, the leading of the Spirit to even recognize a counterfeit. Then he begins to tell them the difference between right and wrong worship. Chapter 12, he begins to address their improper use, and he starts out chapter 12 by saying this, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Some of your translations might say ignorant. Uh, if you really look at the, the Greek meaning behind this, you can say stupid. I don't want you to be so stupid any longer. This is, this is a, this is a uh, strong language Paul is using. Cut it out. You guys are ignorant. You're foolish. You don't know what you're doing. You've got to stop this right away. I can't make it to you, but I can write you letters. And he writes at least two letters uh, to the Corinthians. Paul says, I don't want you to be stupid anymore. I want you to understand this subject so that you can do the work God has called you to. Because you can't do it the way you're doing it now. In addition, Satan, like I said, is counterfeiting. So you can't afford to be ignorant any longer church is falling apart and Paul sees it you can't base your understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit on things you experience or think you see is the point Paul is making in church I think a lot of people have done that in this culture we've based our understanding on what we think the gifts and the work of the Holy Spirit is on what we think we've seen or we went to this church and this certain thing happened and yeah I mean it was a little strange but you know who am I to say that that's not the work of the Holy Spirit well you're not anyone to say but God is the one who defines this says so I can look at what the Bible says and when I know what it says then I can spot the counterfeit that's what Paul tries to do with the Corinthians in his writing in his letters to them so Paul does begin to set the record straight, a standard concerning spiritual gifts. First, they, control, they are controlled by the Spirit. They are given to us by the grace of God and they're used to serve the body and they're empowered by God too. So I, like Paul, want you to understand the spiritual gifts. I don't want you to be ignorant if you are. And you might say, why? Well, the church, this church, cannot mature nor function without us using the spiritual gifts the spiritual gifts God has given to us in the way he desires for us to use them. You must understand how to minister with your spiritual gift. Not just that you have a certain spiritual gift, but how to minister with it for the purpose of edifying, building up, and testifying. How many of you this morning can say, yeah, I've got that figured out. I know how to use my spiritual gift for those purposes, ultimately to bring unity in the body of Christ. Church, if you are not using your spiritual gift in that way for that purpose, you're using it wrong. And I'm not here to chastise you or call you a Corinthianizer. I'm here this morning to set it straight so that we can begin to understand this and so that we're not destroyed by our lack of knowledge. You see, there's a lot of ignorance today concerning spiritual gifts, and I don't want us to be ignorant any longer. We can't abuse gifts, but we also can't ignore them. We can't neglect them. We can't overemphasize the wrong ones. We can't fall into any of these traps. It's happened before many, many times, and there's no place for it here. Paul says this ignorance has to end, and I second that. Any ignorance on this subject has to end. The Spirit of God needs to direct us through his word to an understanding of spiritual gifts that lines up with the word of God and then and only then will our ignorance end. That's what Paul says and that's why he spends the next few chapters ending their ignorance. So Jesus made it clear that he, that, that we know God, that we who know God are the salt and light of the world. Matthew chapter five. Scriptures also call us to be ambassadors to the world and that we're pilgrims in the world. And so Paul told the Philippians that our citizenship, citizenship is not in this world, it's in heaven. That we are sojourners in the world. 
And so there's a purpose for our individual existence as believers and in the society in which we live. It's to turn men to God through Christ. That's the ultimate goal of your spiritual gift. This is not our home. We're just sojourners. We're just pilgrims. We're just passing through. And while we're passing through, we have certain things to accomplish with our spiritual gifts. You see, we are a witnessing community, a group of people placed in the world at this specific time. And I want to stop there a second. Do you realize that if you are in Christ, God placed you in the world at this specific time for a specific purpose and reason? If you're taking History 2 class right now, which we just had um, uh, on last Saturday, uh, Saturday you, you, you have seen how important it is for us to, for, to allow God to use us in the era, the time he places us. We might not see all God's plans, but God's plans are amazing. And we're either going to be a part of that plan or we are going to reject that plan. And a lot of it has to do with how we use our spiritual gifts. I would say perhaps without sounding overdramatic and sensational, perhaps all of what we do has to do with how we use our spiritual gifts. And you'll see a little more in a moment why that's so important. So you got to set you in this era, 2018, in this church, in this time for... The purpose of using your spiritual gifts to edify, testify, build up, and to unify. And perhaps the most thrilling concept of all regarding our identity in Christ is found in Ephesians chapter 4. Till we all come to the unity of faith, is 4.13, till we all come to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature and fullness of Christ. Now that might just sound like gibberish to you, it is mind-blowing what this is saying. Till we all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What's that saying? Spiritual gifts are given to the church so that the world will see the fullness of Jesus Christ himself in us. Are we doing that? Can the world see the fullness of Jesus Christ at work in us? The fullness. The ultimate goal is to build up the church that we might become the fullness of Christ to the world. That's the point, right? God has given some, you know, he's given apostles, prophets, evangelists, teaching pastors, and so forth for the perfecting of the spiritual gifts. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. So God has given us, all of us, spiritual gifts if we are in Christ. Every one of you has one, but he is also called gifted men apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teachers to help perfect those gifts in you. So therefore, as a, a teacher and pastor in this church, if I am not helping you perfect those spiritual gifts, then I am failing as one of God's called gifted men to help you. So I have an even greater responsibility, and that hit me like a ton of bricks this week as I was studying, and I read Ephesians chapter 4, the fullness of the likeness of Christ. Church, are we the fullness of the likeness of Christ? And if we're not, I am called to help you get there. The elders are called to help you get there. And you are called to employ your gifts the way God has given them and called you to use them. The church is to be Christ to the world, to represent him, to reflect him. And brothers and sisters, we'll get to more of this in a moment, the spiritual gifts are literally attributes of Jesus Christ. Teacher, who's the greatest teacher in the whole world? Jesus Christ. That's a spiritual gift, teaching. Prophet. Who is the greatest prophet in the entire world? Jesus Christ. That's a spiritual gift. Faith. Who had the greatest faith in the entire world? Jesus Christ. That's a spiritual gift. We can go right down through. Healing. Who is the greatest healer in the history of the world? Jesus Christ. Every spiritual gift is a manifestation, attribute, personality trait, if you will, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Rolling on the floor and laughing is not a personality trait of Jesus Christ. That's how, you can spot, yeah, that's how you can spot a counterfeit. Every spiritual gift will be a representation and a reflection of Jesus. Jesus was the perfect manifestation of those gifts. And we are given them, not in fullness, because there's no way I could do all the gifts that Jesus had. And so we're given, we're distributed them so that corporately as a body we can represent the fullness of Christ. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand that concept? If you don't, I'm sorry. I, I thought I could explain it pretty well. Talk to me after church. You see, Christ alive in the world through the church is the point of your spiritual gift. Christ alive in the world through your spiritual gifts 
You and me operating in the fullness of our spiritual gifts will accomplish that. And this is a vital reality that we have to understand. The Lord Jesus chose to remain in the world after the ascension. How? Jesus Christ is in this world after his ascension through us. Joel, if you have the gift of discernment, it's a gift given to you by God because it's an attribute of Christ, the ultimate discerner. Mom, you have the gift of hospitality. Jesus was, there was no more hospitable, kind person than Jesus Christ. You've been given that gift to represent Christ. Do you understand how the gifts line up with who Christ is? And when we use them, we are being and reflecting, manifesting Christ in this world. That is how important spiritual gifts are. And if you don't, if that doesn't give you goosebumps like it's giving me right now, then I'm saying it wrong. Your gift is the personality, the nature of Christ alive in you. That is why you have it. It is not to scream uncontrollably and do weird, strange things and to make yourself look more holy than the other person. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with pointing to Christ. And if you are not using your gift for that express purpose, for the unifying of the church, then I'm here to tell you this morning, we need to fix it. Just as Paul began to fix it with the Corinthian church, we need to fix it. It's vital that we understand. The spiritual gift is the likeness of Christ alive in you. The likeness of Christ alive in you. That's your spiritual gift. That's what a spiritual gift is at its core. The likeness of Christ alive in you. Teaching, I already pointed it out. The ultimate teacher. Mercy. If you have the gift of mercy, who is more merciful than someone that would die for us? Jesus Christ. Service of helps. Who is more helpful than Christ? And who is the ultimate servant? Jesus Christ. If you've been given these gifts, church, it's because you're a, you a reflection of your Savior. Exercise that spiritual gift under the leading of the Holy Spirit to the best and fullness of not just your ability, but of the yielding to the Spirit that He would enable you. And that's important. Spiritual gifts are very simply put the nature, the personality, and the character of Jesus Christ, character of Jesus Christ at work in us. And that is a profound thought. And if you remember nothing else from this sermon this morning, remember this about your spiritual gift. It is the personality, the character of Jesus Christ at work displayed and manifested in you and in me. So I've been given one of the gifts uh, of, of teaching. Am I doing that? When I am teaching, is Christ seen through my teaching? If I'm not, then I'm not using my spiritual gift right and properly, and I need to pray for the Spirit to enable me in that. I'm, gonna have you, I'm not going to ask you what your spiritual gifts are. Honestly, I believe that's between you and the Lord. We're going to define them in a few weeks. If you don't know, I hope you find out through prayer and discernment, discerning and understanding this next couple of weeks. But you need to look at your spiritual gift with that scope, with that lens. Do people see Christ through me? Am I a representative of Christ through my spiritual gift? Because church, if we are not Christ in the world, who else is going to be? Who else will be? Nobody. We are literally here to represent him and manifest his character to this world. The Bible says that he has planted within us the spirit of Christ. Romans 8, 9 says that. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, or uh, it says that, and it also says, now if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to God. But brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ this morning, then you've received that spirit. And then Galatians 2, 20 says, if you've received the Spirit, then your life is not your own. How you want to use that spiritual gift is not your decision. Brothers and sisters, Christ reproduces himself in the world through you. How? Through the proper use of your spiritual gifts. With this understanding then of spiritual gifts, which I hope some minds are blown if you've never understood that before, 
Would you say that you're using your spiritual gifts in this way? With this understanding, with this profound depth of realization and richness to your spiritual gifts, are you using it for that express purpose in this way? When you exercise your spiritual gift, do you say, Lord, you have given me this gift. Help me to represent Christ as I use it. I have to pray that every morning before I teach because honestly, on my own, I would pray, I'd be terrible at this. It's the Spirit who enables us. It's the Spirit who enables me to teach. It is the Spirit that enables you to use your gift. But church, Christ not only indwells in every individual believer, this is important too. And I know this sermon may be a little long and that's fine because I want to get the record straight. Not only does he exist in you if you are a believer and minister in you, but Ephesians 2.22 says that the entire church is built together as a habitation of Christ. So not only individually does Christ represent and manifest himself in you, but brothers and sisters, and this is awesome, this is exciting, corporately, corporately, we are the inhabitant, the indwelling of Jesus Christ as a group, together. That's our goal the inhabitation of Christ on earth. He produces his character in us first by indwelling in us, Ephesians 4, 7, and 8, and then 11, 13 goes on to say that he, uh, that he reproduces himself through the body as well, individually through the body. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ, Ephesians 4, 7. Every one of us is given a measure of grace according to the gift that Christ gives you. By grace, Christ has given the believer certain gifts, certain divine enablements. Not one Christian is excluded. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. We don't control it. We are stewards. Are you a good steward of your gift or gifts? Big question. Are you a good steward? You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. I, I'm, a, I'm a wicked, fallen sinner saved only by the grace of God. Do I deserve to look anything like Jesus Christ? No. No. No, I don't. But praise be to God that he gives me, he gives me supernaturally the nature of Christ, at least in one gift, maybe more. Some are given more. And that's why it's important for us to say to the measure. We're all given a different measure of the gifts. It might be two for you and it might be four for me or vice versa. And it's not you, it's not up to you to decide which gift you get. And it's not up to you to counterfeit one because you think one's more important. Brothers and sisters, there's a heavier burden on the elders of this church and the teachers because I'm given to you, we're given to you to help perfect those gifts in you. And that's why the Bible tells us be not many teachers, <laughs> be not many masters because our work is hard. And yet, think about it this way. It is Christ who enables my work. And it is Christ who enables your work. I don't have to try to drum up some, some gumption to go do my work. The Holy Spirit will lead me if I'm walking in the Spirit, just like with you. You don't have to drum up some desire to be merciful. If God's given you that gift, you need to trust the Holy Spirit to produce that mercy in you. Again, it's nothing we earn. It's given to us. One of the difficulties in the church today is because the, the, the gifts aren't, aren't manifested the way they should is because the church is so fractured in general. Christians are disobedient in the area of gifts, and giftings, lead, leaders are failing to perfect the saints and the entire body of Christ is then crippled, distorted, and confused. The world cannot see Jesus Christ in us because we look nothing like him far too often. While many church services don't look anything like the Corinthian service, isn't it true that there are divisions in churches today? Same thing. Their worship might not be as outrageous. There's division in churches today, right? Sexual sin, fornication, off the charts in churches today. Carnality, personality clicks. Well, I like this teacher better than this teacher, better than this teacher, better than this teacher. 
the insubordinate feminist movement has made its way into the church. And there's no questioning that on many levels. Worldly wisdom. Well, how do we build a church nowadays? Well, we just make it cool. We make it appeal to the world. And then we fill our pews with people of the world. We don't have a church at all. We have a worldly country club. There's books you can buy, books you can buy on how to set up your church like a business to make it appealing to the world. That's human wisdom, church. Every one of these things are in the church. And ultimately, the final one is prominent, prominent too, the abuse of spiritual gifts because we are a mess. I'm not saying we here this morning, although I, there's probably some here that have to look at this list and say, I need to repent. Church will never get to the bottom one to where we stop abusing and perverting our spiritual gifts until we seek unity in Christ in all things. Until we do away with the carnality of our flesh and we begin to allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit. And that's what this whole sermon series has been about. And that's where we're going to end. That's where we're going. That's the thread woven through everything we've discussed. The Spirit of God has created in us a common goal. Church, and if we're not accomplishing that, then we're no different than the Corinthian church. Sure, our, our worship service might look a little more orderly. But if we don't accomplish the common goal to use our spiritual gifts to build the church up, to edify, to testify, and to unify. Just pack up our bags. Go home. You see, brothers and sisters, and this is so important, and something I don't think we often think of. You see, it's not our job to create unity in the church. The Spirit creates unity. There's one Spirit, right? Spirit speaks to Spirit. There's unity in the Spirit. We have to stop interrupting it. I'm going to say that again. We don't have to create unity. The Spirit is unified. It's our, he's already one with God and with us. We have to stop interrupting the unity in the church through this crud. We have to stop interrupting it. Unity is here. It's right here with us right now. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God alive in you. We already have it. Stop interrupting it. You just need, we don't, like I said, we don't need to create unity. We have to stop creating division. Now, what does unity have to do with the gifts? Because that might seem like a little digression. It's not. Everything, everything. It's critical that we minister to each other in unity and minister to each other in our spiritual gifts because that creates and solidifies weaves together our unity. If I, am, if I am using my spiritual gift and you see the likeness of Christ in me, in my spiritual gift, and I in you, you we're going to have unity, church. And not only are we going to have unity, but we're also going to be the reflection of Christ both to each other and to this world. And as soon as somebody, whether it's this body or anybody, throughout the world stops interacting with each other, stops sharing with each other, stops attending fellowship with each other, stops ministering to each other in, in using their spiritual gifts, they're easily picked off by Satan and every one of us has seen it every single time. What happens when somebody separates themselves? They get maybe a little offended. They don't like what the pastor said. They don't like what this person said to them. What do they do? They isolate themselves. What does Satan do? I got a sheep all to myself. And he destroys that person's faith. You see, church, unity is everything in the church, but we don't have to create it. We just have to stop resisting it, stop interrupting it. So church, as we close, we must remember that a spiritual gift is a God-given capacity, God-given capacity through which the Holy Spirit supernaturally ministers to the body and to the world. It's a God-given capacity. You don't have the capacity to do it. I don't. It's a God-given capacity to do that. It's not something that you can do humanly. It's something the Spirit must do in you. And I've heard people say all sorts of things are spiritual gifts. Well, my spiritual gift is playing the guitar. No, it's not a spiritual gift. You can pray, anybody, pretty much anybody can practice to play the guitar well. You might be more gifted musically, but that's not a spiritual gift. Playing guitar is not a spiritual gift. Now, there are gifts that may be helpful to that, 
but cooking well is not a spiritual gift or any other thi human thing is not a spiritual gift, okay? That's not what we're talking about. We're going to define that more next week, but I just want to put that on your mind, okay? Building something well is not a spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts are very distinct and they all point to an attribute of Christ. That's what a spiritual gift is. And I want you to leave with that understanding this morning. And again, I said, like I said, I'm not going to ask you how many of you know your spiritual gifts. I asked you that question a couple weeks ago, and I hope you thought about it. I'm not going to ask you probably that question again. Because I think ultimately it's between you and God. Ultimately it's between you and God. You need to ask God what your spiritual gift is if you don't know. Don't look to me because you know what? I'm just a man. I might tell you something wrong. I might counterfeit a gift for you. I don't know. God does. Ask him to manifest it in you. Some of you do know what your spiritual gifts are. Praise God. Are you using it with this understanding of what we just discussed this morning? Are you? And if not, that's okay. It's not okay to keep not using it, but it's okay that you're not. Now's the time to get our hands dirty. Put an end to any foolish thought we have about the gifts of the Spirit and begin to manifest them so that Christ is manifest in us. Brothers and sisters, you are a steward. You don't own your spiritual gift. You don't. And I don't own mine. And right now, where you sit this morning in your pew, you are either a case of good management of your spiritual gift or poor management. I'm a black and white guy because this is a black and white book. Either you, where you sit this morning, you are a case of good management of your spiritual gift or poor management. Ask the Lord to identify which one is you and then pray for the strength and the leading of the Spirit that you might manifest your gift so that this body can be edified through you. Do you realize you are here because you have to, must edify this body in some way, whatever your spiritual gift may be? You know what, brothers and sisters, I've been in the ministry and the church a long time to hear all sorts of people tell me what their spiritual gifts are. I've heard many people tell me, just off the top of my head, that their spiritual gift was helps. And then as soon as the email goes out that someone needs help, that person's nowhere to be found. And any time they do help, you have to beg them to help. That would be a case of misuse. If you really think your, 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 your spiritual gift is something like helps, use it for unity in the body. Use it. God has given that to you. It's a gift to the body. Not, it, it's a gift to you, but primarily not for you. It's for the body. Use it. And so church, if the unity of the body is to be maintained, then the ministry of the gifts is absolutely necessary. The unity of the body is to be maintained. The use of your gift, your gift. I don't want to make you feel more important than you are, but you are important. Do you look at yourself as important to a body? And I mean vitally important, not just a little bit important or, you know, I guess uh, we, I, I have to say this person's important, so they're important. I guess. No, you are vitally important. And this body needs you to be Christ. This body needs you to be Christ to the person sitting next to you and to the person that you run into out on the street. You see, the Corinthian church had corrupted the whole system. They were not content with the gift God has given. They wanted different ones. And they were perverting the ones they did have. I hope that doesn't describe anybody here this morning. You see, brothers and sisters, Paul writes in the very beginning of the book, you guys are richly endowed. You have it all. You have the spiritual gifts. Now you need to learn how to use them. I'm going to say that to us this morning. Church, if you are in Christ, you are richly endowed. You are richly endowed. Are you using that endowment of the spiritual gift the way you've been called to? Are you being faithful using that gift? Do you reflect the character of Christ in this church and to the world? And do you understand that we are part of a living, indestructible body of Christ ministering to each other and to the world? Let's pray.